And finally, I would like to welcome one of our hometown heroes, Dr. Jose Azel. He's a senior scholar at the Institute for Cuban and Cuban American Studies at the University of Miami, Go Canes, my alma mater, and has written extensively about the relationship of Iran, Cuba, and Venezuela. I'd like to remind our witnesses that your entire statements have been made a part of the record, and I kindly uh, suggest that you summarize your remarks uh, to no longer than five minutes each. And we will begin our expert testimony with Dr. Bailey. Dr. Azell. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member, Mr. Berman, distinguished members of the committee. I am honored to have this opportunity to share my views on the growing Iranian influence in Latin America, and I commend you for calling this hearing on what is often an underestimated and misunderstood threat to our national interests. Iran is an increasingly important political economic player in Latin America. Its influence transcends geography, language, culture, and religion. At the heart of this growing Iranian influence is a peculiar trilateral configuration with Cuba and Venezuela. The basis of this rather eccentric alignment is not east-west political philosophy or a coalition based on congruent economic models or north-south ideological affinity. Even more perplexing, it is a strategic alliance that transcends profound theological differences. What then brings together Fidel Castro, a Marxist-Leninist atheist, Hugo Chavez, a putative socialist Christian, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the product of Islamic fundamentalism? What allows the Iranian theocracy, so removed from Latin America by ethnicity, by customs and values, to play an increasingly influential role in our hemisphere. If we answer these questions in terms of the growing economic ties among these countries, and there are many, both licit as well as illicit and covert, we would be basing our analysis on a strict Western economic rationality. We would be mistakenly extrapolating our logical model to the likes of Castro's, Chavez, and Ahmadinejad. A second analytical mistake is to scrutinize Iran's influence in discrete country-by-country -country terms rather than in terms of the synergies and the symbiosis of the Tehran-Habana-Caracas alliance. We will further compound our error if we formulate U.S. foreign policy in similarly disconnected terms. As world events have repeatedly demonstrated, we eventually gain the Socratic insight that we know very little of the logical reasoning models of autocratic leaders. Although it may seem that way to us, these countries do not follow any rational foreign policy. The analytical challenge for the United States is to understand in our cultural milieu actions arising in another. In the case of Iran, Cuba, and Venezuela, the unifying point seems to be a virulent hostility towards the United States, liberal democracy, and Israel. In other words, the Ahmadinejad Castro Chavez nexus is fundamentally an anti-American alignment, and as such, and I think this is critical, it follows its own logic and its own rules of engagement. The growing Iranian influence in Latin America, together with its Cuban and Venezuelan connections, should be understood in this context of an anti-American alliance determined above all other considerations to undermine U.S. national interest. Cuba and Venezuela have become the most strident defenders of Iran's nuclear ambitions, and the three countries have formed a strategic partnership to evade U.N. and U.S. economic sanctions. Moreover, Cuba's sophisticated intelligence and counterintelligence capabilities are reportedly shared with Iran and Venezuela. The Tehran, Havana, Caracas bloc speaks with a unified anti-American voice at the UN and other international forums in a concerted effort to undermine U.S. influence by any means at their disposal. In addition to these diplomatic maneuvers, the bloc seeks to increase U.S. economic costs in a variety of ways, from impacting the price of commodities to providing support for anti-American and terrorist groups, to collaborating with Russia and China in opposing U.S. initiatives, and of course, 
by Iran seeking to become a nuclear power. It is within the realm of the possible that should Iran succeed in deploying and developing its nuclear capabilities, Venezuela may seek deployment on its own territory. This geopolitical alignment, if it can be described as ideological at all, is based on an ideology of hate towards the United States, Israel, and democratic governing principles. Distinguished members, the formulation of U.S. foreign policy is often imbued with inherent tensions between policies anchored on our democratic values and policies based on our national interests. In this case, a rare congruence exists for clarity of purpose in a coordinated U.S. foreign policy that blends our support for democratic values with our national security concerns. First, our foreign policy should pay far more sustained attention to Latin America. And second, unambiguously, we should take advantage of this congruence of purpose to be unabashed and not timid in supporting our positions to the tyrants that threaten our national interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses for excellent uh, testimony. I have a question for uh, Dr. Bailey and for Dr. Assel. Dr. Bailey, your, your former employer, the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, stated that Iran's leader now, uh, leaders now appear willing to conduct an attack within the United States and uh, is, quote, trying as hard, uh, trying as well to penetrate and engage in this hemisphere, end quote. Do you agree with uh, Director Clapper's ass assertions, and does Iran have the capabilities uh, and the interest to use uh, countries in Latin America as a platform to launch attacks against us here in the U.S.? And Dr. Azell, for you, your prepared testimony, you say that uh, the foundation of the Iran-Cuba-Venezuela relationship is an anti-American alignment. Because these nations actively work to undermine uh, U.S. interests, what, can, what do you think we can expect in the future uh, to be their chosen mode of uh, aggression from this alliance against us in the United States? Would it be Iran's uh, nuclear aspirations, Cuba's uh, oil drilling uh, program that just recently started, the upcoming Venezuelan elections, et, et cetera? Uh, so, Dr. Bailey, we'll start with you. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> yes, Iran certainly has the desire, uh, and it is increasingly has the capability of threatening the United States in the Western Hemisphere. Um, several of these uh, events have, have been, or these possibilities have been mentioned. Uh, I would also add the threat to the, to the Panama Canal, to close the canal. Um, they are, have been talking, of course, about closing the Straits of Tehran for some time. Uh, but uh, they, they have the capability to close uh, the uh, Panama Canal. That is uh, clearly a threat to the United States. The recent uh, discovery uh, of a plot uh, to, uh, to, uh, of a cyber attack against the United States, uh, which resulted in the expulsion of the uh, Venezuelan consul in, in Miami, um, and uh, simply the, the fact that uh, uh, Venezuela now, the Venezuelan government now issues passports and uh, Venezuelan identity documents to, uh, freely to uh, Iranian agents in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, permits them to uh, travel wherever they want and, and uh, uh, within the hemisphere and including across the, the border into the United States as has been uh, very extensively documented. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Zell? But I'm sure the most threatening scenario, of course, is a nuclear Iran with a complicit Venezuela that may be willing to offer its territory for deployment of Iran's nuclear weapons. In such a case, we'll find ourselves in 1962 all over again. Um, but in addition to that uh, scenario, these countries are continuously using their influence in all the international forums to undermine U.S. influence everywhere and to increase our operating costs, whether it be by impacting the price of commodities, commodities or anything else. I am also particularly concerned with the sharing of intelligence, as we do 
No Cuban intelligence and counterintelligence capabilities are exceptional, and they are reportedly sharing all that information with Iran. That is a very threatening scenario. Thank you. If you want to make it real quick, Mr. Azul. Well, yeah, Mr. absolutely. Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. Uh, it's yeah. only the point that I try to develop that if we look for logic uh, in these regimes, uh, we're not going to find logic as we understand logic. This is about odium. This is about hate for the United States and democratic governing principles. Uh, let us recall, for example, that in 1979, with the victory of the Islamic uh, Revolution, Fidel Castro abandoned his long-term support for uh, the Communist Party in, in Iran and embraced the Ayatollah Khomeini at that time. In his mind, the anti-Americanism of the Ayatollah trumped his anti-communist uh, philosophy. So. It, it, my, my point is simply that we should not look for the kind of logic that we employ in our analysis. Okay. Let me ask uh, Dr. Bailey and um, Dr. Zhao. I've seen media reports that indicate uh, um, Hezbollah um, has uh, possibly set up a uh, base in Cuba. Um, what is uh, uh, the nature of this, of, the, of these reports, and any potential nexus between Havana, Tehran, and and Caracas and the impact it could have on U.S. national interests. I'll start with Ms. Dr. Azell. Well, there are, of course, numerous reports of training bases in, in, in Cuba that have aided the terrorist uh, networks. There are also uh, substantiated reports of um, Cuban scientists helping with um, chemical plants in, in, in Tehran, for, for example. So that there is really a network of, of uh, things that, that we can point at with a specificity. Uh, my, my concern is when we look at, at these things is do we have the right analytical framework? And, and uh, whatever the evidence may or may not be, uh, what I am trying to emphasize is that we need to understand the threat not from Iran in discrete terms in each country, but these countries acting in unison. Uh, when I mentioned earlier that my worst nightmare would be a nuclear Iran and a Venezuela willing to accept deployment of those weapons in Venezuelan territory, for example, 